What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the 440 Guitar Podcast. I am your host today, Jarrell Powell. Thank you so much for tuning up. Uh, you can get the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and uh, anchor.fm forward slash 440. Uh, feel free to follow the podcast as well on our Instagram at the 440 Guitar Podcast just to get updates on the episodes coming out. And of course, you have uh, if you have any questions regarding to uh, maybe an artist you wanted to, to con- uh, connect with me that I'd be able to reach out to them or just questions at all, feel free to uh, direct in, uh, direct message me through the Instagram or you could just send me an email directly at uh, the 440podcast.com uh, or, or 440podcast at gmail.com. So feel free to do that if you'd like to do so. And today I am very excited uh, because I have had an uh, earlier episode way, way back earlier in the 440 Guitar Podcast days asking uh, just about this artist because uh, at that particular time, uh, there's a lot of folks that are just wondering, you know, what what music that he's working on and, and just and things of that nature and have uh, really has made a huge impact uh, uh, with a lot of people, including myself. Uh, very excited to speak with this artist. Uh, they have they, they've been a they've been uh, part of a, a, a multitude of different projects, including uh, Crime and Choir, The Advantage, Holy Smokes, Flossen, ENT, Hella, uh, the uh, uh, Hua Hua, Hua. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, and then Chant O, the Chant O's, which has uh, released a project this year as well. Uh, but I wanted to give uh, say this quick quote here before. Uh, introducing this guest, uh, this is from Augmented Fourth on the band camp, and, they, and they said, in quote, uh, McWhorter's music uh, is music by a guitarist for guitarists, representing uh, the bond between a man and his instrument, more so than focusing on compositional and orchestral concerns. Uh, the 440 Guitar Podcast is excited to have uh, Carson McWhorter uh, on the show here. <laughs> Carson, how are you doing? <laughs> Pretty good. Thanks for that introduction. <laughs> of, course. of course. I'm doing good. Thanks for having me also. Oh, of course. Yeah, my, my pleasure. My pleasure indeed. Um, so, uh, man, it, it's it's crazy uh, that uh, to, I, I'm incredibly excited. Definitely an honor to speak with you. Um, but just to ask you know, briefly, uh, you know, given that, you know, restrictions are down, a lot of artists, guitarists, they're able to play music again, you know, book tours. I'm here. I'm seeing artists that, you know, they, they've announced tour dates and stuff again. Uh, you know, how does it how does it feel to be able to, you know, be able to to, you know, work on music safely and with other people again? Uh, that it feels good. I, I would have to say that, like, I'm maybe not you know, sort of in the same boat as a lot of other musicians Correct. It, yeah. being that I've always kind of had like an, uh, a kind of like different approach to like my relationship to being a professional musician mm-hmm. or, and, and even my, uh, relationship to like performing in general and mm-hmm. how I felt about being a performer. Uh, so yeah, uh, although I do just, just before the pandemic, I was, a I was a part of a, a group, something that wasn't of like, uh, of my design only. It was sort of like a democratic project and, mm-hmm. and it was, um, you know, like a synth pop band called glass bat. Oh, wow. And, and so the pandemic pretty much like stopped all progress that that band was making. Uh, so, so it definitely had a, had an effect. We had, we were going to be, um, recording and it sort of ruined our recording schedule. Mm. And, um, and then we've all sort of, you know, it made sort of everyone have to like, I'm, I moved during the pandemic also. There's just a lot of things that, that happened. So it really shook things up. Mm. And, you know, the way it's settling now, I kind of, I have to say also at the beginning of the pandemic, I was working on that project, but I had just started working on uh, a collaborative project with uh, Zach Nelson, who is also in the band Chantos with me. Mm. I think this collaborative project is still just a continuation of Chantos, Mm. but totally different. We had already started. I I was basically getting off work and just going home and not talking to anyone, just working on this stuff (laughs) (laughs) just before the pandemic hit. And then when the pandemic hit, I was like, yes, I have a good excuse to just like totally isolate. (laughs) It was sort of like an introvert's dream at first. Oh yeah. (laughs) Uh, Then I think as like, 
time went on, it was just like, okay, this sucks. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, I'm an introvert, but I need a little bit more than that, you know? Right. That's how I feel. Yeah. I'm an introvert myself. So it's like, oh, working remotely. How terrible. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah I, I'm, I am excited to see how to settle that thing. People did a lot of either work on their own music or just like work on themselves like intentionally or unintentionally through the pandemic. So people, I think uh, everyone is a little bit different and everyone that I've run into or talked to is a little bit different than them. It'll be interesting to see just sort of like what musically comes out of this, you know, how people are going to approach right. their musical careers. And um, so I'm kind of excited about, about, the changes mm. and not necessarily um, the uh, the era that I was most attached to mm. musically that like I was most thrilled by had already kind of ended. Mm. Um, and so the phase that was happening just before the pandemic wasn't my, wasn't my favorite phase of music anyway. <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it, I think it'll be good because I, I think any sort of, limitations and restrictions and sort of working against odds tends to always be kind of good for creativity mm, yeah in my mind so. yeah well definitely uh, I, I definitely uh very interesting perspective definitely insightful there um so on the 440 guitar podcast uh, we're really big on origin stories how people got to where they are today uh so just to, to kick it right off here tell me about your uh earliest memories of music hmm um let's see uh so uh my parents i i'm one of those that had parents that were musicians my hmm. parents were both in uh they were in a band. They were, they were hippies. They were in a big hippie band where they all lived on a big ranch. Everyone in the band lived together mm. and they they like had it. They toured in a, in a renovated school bus, mm. you know, that was all painted and stuff. Mm. And, and they were, their band was sort of like a, uh, like a more hippie, uh, um, like Almond Brothers meets Sons of Champlin, I don't know if you're familiar with that band, uh, Sons of Champlin, or maybe like a couple of the guys were a little bit into Weather Report, but they were still kind of just the, uh, you know, they were still just kind of white hippies from the West Coast, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, but that that was like, so I, when I was really young, maybe I was around a couple of concerts. Uh, they got into like kind of religious stuff, mm. and then it kind of turned into a a Christian band and they went through weird phases where, you know, they were like burning their records and hmm. only doing worship music. And, uh, so like, you know, my, uh, yeah, I would say like, be, that was like when I could barely remember any of it, like that was going on. Hmm. And then, uh, so music was sort of always around, but my parents, you know, my mom would play piano around the house hmm. Um, pretty much by the time I was like choosing things for myself and having like a, an identity that I, that I can remember at this point, mm. uh, my parents had sort of like gone on to other phases of life and weren't playing music as much and would kind of come back. My dad would do these sort of weekend warrior bands, like blues bands. And mm. my mom would sing in like a barbershop quartet for a little while. So they were doing music stuff, but it wasn't very, it was sort of like hobby sort of things right. um, and and there were always instruments around um like i still have a, an old champ amp that belonged to the to the guitar player in their old band oh, wow. which was called waterfall <laughs> so like i i still use that amp it's the one they you know i haul around with me all the time <laughs> um and yeah but they never they never like sat down and tried to teach me mm. any music. So I thank them for being, you know, for, you know, being sort of like open to the idea of me being a musician, but they never, they never really pushed it. And, 
you know, I tried to do lessons in school, early elementary school stuff. I started on clarinet, but sucked. <laughs> and then I went to like snare drum and I don't remember what happened with that. Mm. Um, and then I didn't touch instruments again until, um, you know, like junior high again, it was like, I went to like this church camp mm. and I think at this church camp, uh, uh, it was the first time I learned a, a song on an acoustic guitar. Mm. I don't rem- you know, it's like someone taught me smoke on the water or some, some, something yeah. like that or whatever. <laughs> and I was like, that was the first time that Lucifer called to me. <laughs> 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 but it was like, I was immediately like not interested in the church camp and was just, I was like interested in the guitar, yeah. like from that point forward, you know, like it was, um, yeah, just, uh, so didn't stick with any of the religious stuff and then just went, mm. went just focused on guitar from that point <laughs> forward, you know, and then, and then there was, you know, then there was like, you know, progressions, you know, like, I, I don't know how many like actual songs, you know, I, I learned early Mm -hmm. on before I just started like noodling Mm -hmm. on my own. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really glad during that early period and all through high school that like my mom, bless her heart. Uh, the best thing that she could have done for me was just never complain about like me and my friends making noise in the garage. Like (laughs) just never like her story of it, like to this day is just like, well, it wasn't always the best thing to listen to, but at least I knew where you were. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she, so she just, you know, she just sort of let it go and <laughs> never tried to like add anything like, why don't you guys learn this song? Or, <laughs> you know, didn't, didn't really offer up any direction advice or anything. So mm, interesting. I was curious to get your, your thoughts on, um, you know, when you when you started to really get you know acclimated with the instrument, uh, tell me about some of your your influences or uh, around the guitar or just music in general that connected with you. Uh, you know, uh, learning the guitar and playing the guitar. Well, uh, you know, like I started, I started. Like I said, I was like, it was around junior high mm-hmm. that I started. And, and so that was like, you know, like, um, and that was around the time that like grunge stuff was going off. So it was like, mm-hmm. a lot of, you know, it was like Nirvana and then, and then it was like right around that time. And like, I'm, you know, I'm from, uh, Sacramento mm-hmm. and that was, you know, like Deftones was really starting to go off locally around that time. Although I don't think I don't can't remember when the first time I saw them live was, um, but yeah, you know I was listening to things like Nirvana, and then I got into Tool, and you know it was like Metallica. I'd maybe learn like a a part of I'm, I've never been really good at like learning whole entire songs, sort of like I'll learn a little like chunk of a riff or something that I think you know at the time I probably was wrong about how I was learning the <laughs> riffs or whatever, but I would learn a little bit of it. And then I would just start writing my own thing using like those notes or like Mm -hmm. the rhythms or something. I, I, you know, I I could never focus long enough to like learn someone's entire song. It was just enough for me to like learn a a couple little note pattern. And then I was like off on doing something else. (laughs) Um, You know, so, so I think probably like freshman year high school or whatever, I think I probably was like, you know, writing a bunch of like, you know, Metallica and Tool ripoff licks, <laughs> um, you know, never really learning anything fully of theirs, but just like writing these like, sort of like ripoff licks mm. in the style of, of course, you know, it's like Tool, uh, Rage Against the Machine had a big impact on me early on, mm. but, but around that time stuff was so like, um, you know, music had come alive for me so much 
that it's hard to put my finger on one thing because so many, I listened to so much. I mean, it was just like, mm. that's what it, what I was doing. Once I got the bug and I was interested in it, I just like couldn't stop. So it was like everything. I was listening to like Herbie Hancock mm. and then I would play a Mr. Bungle song. I would, I would fall asleep listening to Mr. Bungle at night. <laughs> <laughs> like it was just like, uh, I would, you know, it's just always listening to like music. And I, I think it was stuff like, you know, what's the progression that, cause I, it went from listening to sort of like mainstream stuff that I found out about on the radio, you know, tool was kind of weird. And then, you know, Primus was kind of weird. And then it was the, then I realized it was like Primus led to like Mr. Bungle, which led to like influences of like, I started looking into the influences of these other bands and just started like following the, the mm. line of things, you know, like learn, like finding out about XTC from, you know, from Primus like early on or, you mm. know, and I was, so I was listening to just so much. I mean, anything from like Anderson, Lake and Palmer to weather report to mm. whatever. Um, it really, I just went through a lot and that, that continued for, a long time you know like i just was always like really random with my tastes you know i just listen to all kinds of stuff yeah oh. wow yeah because it's interesting because i there's a lot of like for like some of your playing when i when i hear it that really connects with me or just i just find really really unique is there's um, I feel like there's a lot of influences that could be connected to like, uh, like, like Middle Eastern, Middle Eastern type, uh, influences or cadences or just type of like rhythms. And then also like serialism as well. Like, uh, you know, th that I could, that kind of reminds me of like uh, Omar Rodriguez Lopez. Um, so mm -hmm. it, it, it seems like when you're, you know, on your listening journey was, were you listening to things that were, you know, like, uh, I guess beyond like bands and everything too like did you did, did, were you were you expanding uh like listening to that type of music as well because it's interesting because i hear a lot of that in in your playing as well i, I never would have thought i would never would have thought some of your influences you know through through um your playing because you're playing i feel like you have such a signature connected to you know, compared to a lot of other artists yeah like i said it like it's sort of hard to put my finger on mm -hmm. what you know like what had the biggest impact on me yeah because i listened to so much um um i think uh i've always you know i've always felt a i think actually you know one thing that uh, a trajectory one of many trajectories that i can think of was uh you know listening to mr bungle was kind of an interesting thing because they mm -hmm. pulled in uh, uh, a lot of influences, like cultural influences, like mm. chanting stuff. And I sort of, um, I sort of, you know, I would grab onto these little sections and be like, what's that little section? What are they referencing there? And then I would, I would find out somehow or whatever, you know, pre internet <laughs> searches or whatever, I'd be able to find out <laughs> like, you know, I, I, it was probably cause I made friends with some kind of like, weirdo prog guys that worked at a record store. And so we would just talk music a lot, talk mm. influences and like, um, and, and it was, you know, you're right in that. I, I definitely took to a lot of things that were like not band or modern Western music oriented. I started listening to a lot of like, um, a lot of Indian classical music, a mm. lot of like, uh, I would, any record that I could find on weird, like, you know, Indonesian chants and gamelan orchestras or like Bulgarian women's choir stuff or, mm. um, you know, I was just sort of like, I've always sort of had a felt connected to like music that had a, that had a deeper purpose mm. and a lot of, and a lot of bands and Western music. I mean, there, there is a deeper purpose, you know, but I'm more familiar with the, the sort of like, uh, the deeper purpose that comes with being in a band and like, you know, being in a band with your friends and going through these sort of like growing periods, like learning how to play weird music or something there, there is, there is a, 
a deeper purpose in that too. But I, I always sort of liked this sort of um, larger than humanity mm. kind of element that, that a lot of like kind of traditional music would, would um, make me feel like was part of it, you know, whether it is or not, I don't, you know, I don't, didn't learn a lot of the languages that stuff was sung in or mm. whatever, but it, you know, kind of get the idea of like what trance kind of music is like why a group of people would get together and chant for like hours on end mm. to me that stuff was like really interesting um yeah interesting. Uh, kind of like the message behind yeah. the music in a way you know yeah uh well you know a lot of you know like sufi music mm. as you know sufi music is like devotional mm. music so it's has a religious component you know where it's like this i'm not an expert <laughs> not a musicologist so i'll probably get some of this stuff wrong these are like my impressions of like what mm. what this music is and i kind of like intentionally stay a little bit aloof to like the true purpose of it because i kind of like letting my mind wander on what I think. Um, uh, but, mm. um, the, but, you know, the Sufi music does have a component to it where the Sufi music or even gamelan orchestras, um, mm. the, there's a lot of different kinds of things where it's supposed to get you into this state of mind that sort of transcends the human experience, whether it's to connect with God or a higher power or, mm. or, a you know, or, or a jaguar demon, or whatever it is. You know, like um, music is purported to have these like sort of more powerful elements that can come from it. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if it's my. It's. I would say that it's not necessarily like my goal to to try to like make music that does that. Mm. Um, but I've just been influenced by by that stuff because it there's like a certain weight and power behind that kind of music. Yeah. Um, and it also sort of led me into uh, examining music from a different compositional perspective. Um, mm. So like the purpose of the music uh, is not necessarily to make sure that everyone starts and stops at the same time and mm. um, can fit within an hour block and, um, you know, has a sound quality that can be transferred across many different systems or whatever. The, the, the point of the music was quite, is quite a bit different mm. in, in a lot of different traditions. Yeah. And, and I liked, uh, trying to take that in as like a balance to like my sort of Western influence that I was just sort of raised around. You know? mm. I like what you said as far as the how the, you know, the, the connection, as far as like the connection of the music and, and it taking you somewhere in a very, you know, spiritual or just like it, it kind of like a bigger than yourself type of approach. Cause it kind of reminds me of, um, John Coltrane's the love Supreme where he's mm, the, where yeah. he talks about, you know, where like the music that he was writing in that album where he's literally like feeling connected closer to God when he's playing like these, like, insane like insane tangents of music and like you know and 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 the you know of course the rest of his accompaniment you know following him but just this this sense of there's a spiritual connection that he's that that he's uh you know being resonated with so um that's really interesting i kind of i definitely um that's an interesting perspective that that i can i definitely dig definitely yeah, I I love that album. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's a that's a great example. Uh, you know, and that's something that definitely had an influence on me. Mm. Uh, here, you know, Sun Ra. You oh, know, yeah. hearing about these people that are like into this sort of celestial power that was not just that the music could maybe sort of transcend this and like kind of get get deeper into like the root of what it means to be human in a big giant like endless universe or something. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I would say also like to always remember that Alice Coltrane had a huge impact on oh, yeah. John Coltrane at that time. And that her music is like, you know, is, is just as like spiritual and amazing. Mm -hmm. I think that she had a lot to do with expanding his, his, his mind about those things. Um, yeah, uh, absolutely. 
Yeah, yeah definitely. Definitely. Um, I wanted to, you, you said something at the beginning of, of this episode that I thought was really interesting as far as how you have a different approach. You might've said some of this already when it comes to performance or just you know, performing music, playing music, whether it's in a live setting or just, you know, working on music in general. I was curious just to get your, you know, your thoughts and opinions on those things, because I think that's one of the, that's one of the many interesting things for, for me personally, as far as how you approach music and, um, and, you know, and, and, when, and when you release certain, certain projects and just, I feel like there's a very coveted approach that you have, if that makes sense. But, um, yeah, if you wouldn't mind just kind of sharing like your thoughts on on that. Yeah, it's it's, it's kind of a, a a big topic. It's kind of hard to like narrow down certain mm. things to talk about within that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's to anyone that maybe is sort of like familiar with my work uh, or my sort of like presence, mm. like uh, as a musician, it's like probably also familiar with the fact that I like. Uh, I don't release things very often. Um, I don't really, uh, you know, after a certain period of my time, I was kind of going pretty hard for a while earlier on. Mm. Um, you know, I was in, when I was in Hella and the advantage and, and I was in, you know, crime and choir, there were a lot of these bands were like kind of all happening in and around each other. Mm. Um, and there was a, around that time I, I was sure that, that what I was going to be doing was like, I was going to work towards, you know, kind of climbing this ladder of being a professional musician. And, uh, uh, I was excited by the idea of like performing. I don't know really what shifted, but I started sort of questioning it Mm. for myself. Um, and this isn't to say it's like set in stone. I don't, I don't have like a, a philo- I don't try not to have a philosophy that like stays put mm. and, but, but I, but I definitely, and I sort of go back and forth internally and like, I sort of, just, uh, you know, sometimes I'll be like, ah, I really should just release stuff, you know, more often. Uh, I mean, I'm always playing music, right? Mm. Like I, but I think, uh, um, I, I sort of stopped just sort of always recording music. Mm. Um, and sort of just got into this, just like I'm always playing music. Um, and I think maybe in that, I might have missed a couple of really good solid periods of, of what I was working on. Hmm. I'm not recording stuff and releasing things. Hmm. And I just sort of got used to this idea of just sort of letting it go. Um, and that I was kind of okay with the music sort of just coming and going. I was okay with the idea of not being uh, not being successful or not being, uh, like not having music be self-sustaining. I mean, I'm still sort of like, have this weird sort of like um, amorphous ever shifting philosophy of like how I'm willing to like interface with a sort of like capitalistic, um, like rugged individualism, Mm -hmm. like culture. Um, and so I'm not always convinced that that success means the same thing for me <laughs> as yeah. it does for a lot of people that I that I don't see a very clear um, set of steps, you know, like write the song, record the song, put a collection of songs together, record an album, release it, promote it to her. I don't, I don't see a very clear set of those steps mm. as necessary for me to to feel success. Um mm. That's interesting. Yeah. Always. Yeah. That's interesting. Cause sometimes it, I, I do. Sometimes I wish I would, but, <laughs> but, uh, but it, but it just doesn't come. It's a, like, I guess I think about it. Mm. I probably think about it too much mm. or, or I'm willing to explore like letting my life sort of kind of drift a little bit mm. and sort of just like feel things out and let my compositions not become finalized and, um, yeah, That's I, I think that this idea might make people kind of uncomfortable. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, just like the idea of like, oh, you're just going to sort of like kind of loosey goosey, just like kind of float through this stuff. With like, um, it, it is a little bit more intentional than that, um, and it does feel a little bit 
better than that at times you know, mm-hmm. than it sounds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it's funny because I, I was having a conversation with um, one of my other co-hosts for a different podcast that I do. And we we're, were having this conversation around the idea of, of quote unquote, making it. And, you know, his his thought was as far as, you know, he just doesn't he doesn't really like that term of making it because he felt that, you know, for the artists we were discussing, he's like, he, he has a fan base. Like he's not like the biggest artist of all time, but he has a fan base. He has people that connects with his music. Like, well, like he's talking about, like in the music, he's talking about how you wanting, wanting to make it. And he's like, in my mind, he's made it, you know? And then I said, well, I think making it is different for different people. You know, some people it's more on a monetary purpose or, you know, owning your, your music and things of that nature. So, you know, it's just a, it's kind of an interesting, uh, conversation we're having as far as like what is the what what is the point of fulfillment for an artist so yeah i think that's always been a thing that's like ever shifting for me mm. um uh and i've you know i've i've worked with different approaches in mm. the past and sort of depending on who i work with you know i get a lot of different kinds of energy from the different types of people i work with you know mm. times i've you know zach hill's got a got a a, a very specific kind of energy and, and work style, um, which, which, you know, he has a tendency to, uh, to really like, um, draw people into that because it, he, mm. he, you know, he pulled, he, he pulls a lot of energy with him when he's working on something mm. he's like very dedicated, always thinking about, uh, the next thing to be doing, you know, working out song ideas in his head when he's sitting at coffee all the time, thinking mm. about these things. And so you sort of get into it. It's like this whirlwind. Don't get caught up in. And, and the other people I've been around, you know, kind of have varying degrees of of that kind of thing as well. Mm. And uh, that performance. That, and yet. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Kachow. Oh, yeah. I was going to say the song that no, no, you guys perform, Face Tap, is like one of my favorite one of my favorite songs of all time. Like even just like watching from just listening to it, watching the video, and seeing that energy you're talking about. Like I just I fell in love with that song. I was like, oh my gosh, I need more of this. <laughs> Rad. Yeah. Just, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, Zach and I have like a pretty, you know, just like an interesting dynamic. And you'll kind of hear it, mm. you know, the way he works with lots of different people. You know, like what he'll he does with, uh, you know, he, he brings out a certain thing in a lot of different people. Mm. Partly because he he just plays the way he plays. Like he's not gonna like he's not going to hear your riff and be like, Oh, that sounds kind of like this. I'm going to maybe play this kind of rhythm. That's like someone else's style or something. He plays the way he plays at all times. And it's always going to be different than you thought of Mm. your part or whatever, you know? So like that song was a, like, I like most of the parts of that song I had already written. And it was sort of just like this, kind of just this spur of the moment thing. I was living in Portland at the time and I was just going to be down in SAC for a little while. And I was like, Hey Zach, I'm going to come down. Um, I'm, like I'm going to bring some music equipment. Do you want to like work on a song? <laughs> so we just like hammered it out for like a, a few days. Um, you know, we just worked on that one song for like a couple of days and then went in and recorded it basically. Mm. Um, and it just started as like some riffs that I had and then we sort of pieced them together wow. and, uh, and, and, and always though, like listening back to my like early kind of like little demo recordings of them, I can hear Zach's influence right away. Cause mm-hmm. like my, my rhythm, like naturally might've, might've been a little bit more like a little bit more like laid back a little bit more loose. And you can kind of hear that when I'm playing by myself, mm-hmm. I'll tend to be like a little bit loose, a little bit kind of like late to the beat or you know, <laughs> maybe I'll hit that beat. I don't know. Like, <laughs> um, and, and Zach, and Zach is has a very like either right on top of the beat or a little in front of it mm-hmm. or, you know, it's like, you know, a lot, very of, a lot of swinging forceful, involved. Aggressive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, I mean, he, he's got swing. He's got swing. If you think of swing as shifts mm. in rhythm that are not like like you know perfectly like on the metronome. So right. That, uh, you know, we would w- w- the way we would work together. You know, it was just like working parts like for hours on end. You know, we, you know, and that was sort of the same thing with like Hella too. That was like our work style. We would just like work things over and over again for hours and hours and hours. Um, 
mm. same parts. So you get into these like little nuances, you know, where like, like, oh no, I, I, I like it better if I hit, I hit the end of the flam or the beginning of the flam. <laughs> like you start to pay attention to smaller and smaller increments of time and kind of like work each other's parts, like kind of like intertwine each other's parts and like smaller, smaller degrees of like, of time. And <laughs> that's just something like something that only comes about. Well, not only it definitely would come about from just like working things over and over again and letting your like, like, just like, just like smashing your mind against the wall of this song. over and over again. <laughs> uh, I think I, I, I did check on your, uh, I listened to y- your uh, interview with Nick Reinhardt. Oh yeah. And, uh, <laughs> He shared a similar thing, which was uh, like coincidentally around the same time. Mm. I didn't really know Nick that well at the time, but we did uh, the advantage shared a practice space with Terramellos mm. in like in the early days. But I didn't really know them. Like we would sort of like I would say hi as they were leaving the practice space, and then we were coming in uh, just because. Uh, their drummer Vince, his brother Nick, was in the advantage. Oh, there are times. Anyway, a weird connection there, but wow. so we've always sort of like there's I, there might be something to this area of uh, um, that there were these sort of like weird experimental, like extremely hardworking bands mm. that. Um, I don't know. I don't know if Terramellos was actually influenced by Legs on Earth, which was like Zach and Spencer's like pre Hella project, mm. which was out there. But that was a band I think that like around that time that that uh, they basically uh, like Zach Hill and Josh Hill, mm. who actually all we all went to Sack High together. Oh, that's wow. another before these bands ever started that's how i first that's how i met everyone because you know i just ended up in a in a science class with with josh hill who <laughs> who was like later in in hello with me as well um but yeah uh, wow. they dropped we all dropped out of high school and then just like we we're just like well we're gonna do music mm. and so that was like approached it very early on just like well I want to put in more time playing music than I would have put in like hating being in school. So, like, <laughs> so we just like did it. That was all we did all the time, you know, um, mm. as much as we possibly could. I don't know how we did other things or like worked jobs or whatever. <laughs> I can't remember those things. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of funny little tidbits about that, about that recording mm. too. Uh, you know, like that, that recording comes from, there's a video of me recording that song on YouTube. It's just the, the audio I recorded as uh, my friend Sean was like shooting the video. And, you know, like I, I sort of credit, thanks to Sean uh, for like making these videos and using me as sort of like an experiment early on, <laughs> like, <laughs> um, like recording you know, live artists, and, you know, I think his like first video like that was of me. And, and, uh, you know, he, he really, I didn't really think that much of it at the time, mm. <laughs> but it, <laughs> but it was, uh, it ended up being important. Um, uh, so yeah, I totally appreciate Sean Stout for like, for making those videos. Some of them are awkward and weird and we had kind of like kind of dorky ideas and, um, that, that particular recording that you played, I listened back to it and I'm like, Oh man, I was so nervous. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, and, and there's a little bit of element to that in a lot of like, uh, my music, which I've like, uh, you know, or there's this sort of like this, like this, like anxious lurching that happens in the music. And that song kind of has this like visceral, it's like, it's simultaneously like groovy and, and, sloppy and anxious mm. at all at the same time and and uh i sort of uh i was when i put that on the album i had been re- re-recording it like playing it mm. you know like in, in different conditions mm. that weren't inside a uh inside a tour van like <laughs> <laughs> the, the recording 
style of that is like pretty funny too. Like there's a weird, you know, what I actually recorded is, is kind of hilarious. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but I ended up kind of just like gravitating towards that, that sort of first, I think that was the first time I had really played that song all the way through. Mm. So there's, there's some times in that song where I'll hear myself and be like, Oh, I was, I was trying to like decide how many times I was going to do this part, like in the moment, you know, oh. you can kind of hear it. I've, some people have told me that they thought it sounded kind of like improv. I think um, it, it wasn't improv necessarily, but I might've played us, you know, I, I might've played a part, you know, one more time than I had originally intended or something. Cause like, I kind of forgot what came next. <laughs> you know, it was a very <laughs> early take of it. Mm. And I sort of just left it because that's another thing that I tend to decide a lot when releasing things is, um, and it's sort of like become sort of a style of mine is that I, I sort of let things be kind of raw mm. and uh, like uncomfortable and not perfect. And, uh, um, you know, I, I could have spent time recording that song and going in and like punching in parts and making it perfect to a click. You'll notice the, the intro to that song also has been like, you know, I don't, I don't even know what that timing is like. I never, <laughs> I never figured it out when I play it now, I actually kind of play it straight time. Mm. Oh, okay. <laughs> I play it a little when I'm, you know, when I'm, I, I play, a bit of that song a little bit different now i play it slower and less like nervous <laughs> mm. and i you know some stuff is like straighter mm. than it was then or you know like I, i'm constantly making changes to songs at all times wow. but but i but i'm glad that i put out that version of it yeah you know, it, the like sort of raw version of it yeah uh, i love i rather than sort of nitpicking it and making it perfect yeah, I I love that version because it to me like there's such a there's I feel like the song has a pulse like it has a pulse and then like it really takes you it really takes you somewhere you know I feel like it's like I'm a fan of structure but sometimes things can be too structured where the the characterization is kind of just like bland so for this song it's like it really takes you somewhere and there's this pulse and you know and, and the the timing and then just kind of the building of these these melodies and whatnot I was just like man like you know it's just like mind blown <laughs> I'm glad you glad you heard that in there <laughs> um, oh yeah I actually I, I should mention also that you, you brought up that song and uh, that uh, that song, um, a friend of mine, RT um, or Ryan Thomas, it'd be easier to search. Um, mm -hmm. uh, he, he just released a film. He's, he sort of makes a, uh, he makes surf films mm. and I've sort of had music featured on a couple of his surf films. Nice. Um, and you might also know him. Uh, he, he made a hella documentary Mm. called portals and so that was like uh, another thing that he did sort of in this music in this scene that we we're in mm. um but he just released this this movie that he was able to finish up because the pandemic gave him the time or forced him to have the time to do this mm -hmm. um called uh, temporal collections mm. and uh that just got released and it's a surf film i'm not a surfer mm. um it's uh, maybe in another life I would have gotten into it, but, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but watching, it's like the perfect, um, for me, it's like the perfect music video. He used a lot of my music off of that album and he mm -hmm. used some Chanto's stuff and, um, to really kind of like, like honored my music a lot throughout this film that he just released. And, wow. Awesome. Um, so that's like, if anyone's curious to see, see that uh, uh and, you know he did, and i with i gave him the go ahead and he did a little stuff where he'll like kind of like loop apart more times uh so that it sort of like lines up with like what's happening in the in like the sur in, in, in the surfing you know mm. and, and in the environment that he's shooting i guess i should say that it's a it's a surf film but it has like a very like artistic quality to it mm. um and it's like has like a lot of like nature shots. It's almost like the Baraka mm. of of surf films or something. <laughs> um, anyway, that 
that if if you want to see that stuff with like a kind of music video type atmosphere, that's uh, I would recommend people check that out. And I thought that was really interesting. If you um, if you won't mind, just kind of speaking a little mm-hmm. bit as far as to just working on that project. Yeah. So, um, and like the sort of like timeline, like when we started, I, I, I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> the earliest files I have from that song are from 2005, mm. which puts it sort of like, um, you know, like in between working on like crime and choir and before mm. I started playing in Hella and, um, <laughs> but around that time, I think, like all of us, I was also doing, I was doing a lot of like improv shows and like kind of like, uh, well, we call them improv shows. They might've been noise shows. They might've just been like, uh, like, uh, musical destruction shows. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, the deconstructionist, uh, sort of, uh, sort of performances, I guess. Mm. Um, and with, with Zach Nelson, but also, uh, Zach Hill and I, or, you know, like there was like a, a bunch of us were all just doing lots of these different like live performances. So I did a bunch of improv stuff with Zach Hill, a bunch of stuff with Zach Nelson, I, both me playing piano as in that song or, you know, guitar or various things mm. as well. Um, and so around that time, yeah, we were just doing a lot of really weird shows, just like pop up shows you know yeah. kind of um you know random weird things we, yeah. often we're like breaking stuff you know it's like <laughs> all the all the like show faults that could come about always come about when you're like at most on the edge of like knowing what you're going to be doing you know it's like we had no idea what we were going to be doing mm. uh, and actually kind of an interesting thing about zach nelson and i's uh, like musical relationship uh, a little bit before that a few years before that the first time we ever got together to play we didn't really know anything about each other's past necessarily we knew we had mutual friends and sort of knew things about each other but we just sort of got together and played and then we or you know when we got together we, were, we had a discussion we we're like do you want to like you know work out a riff or how do you want to approach playing together and, and uh and, and we just sort of decided, like, let's just, like, like count off to four and just start going. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that was just it. Like, that was sort of, like, our style. That was, like, the beginning of it. You know, like, it, it worked out great the first time. Um, and so it, our, our style of improvisation was, like, had nothing to do with, like, knowing a ton about music and working around scales or... Mm or whatever it had like kind of everything to do with, uh, um, you know, trying to like match each other's energy and, um, trying to make live composition Mm. like, you know? Yeah. Um, so like we maybe do some things that you don't hear and like, uh, in sort of like more sophisticated in like, like free jazz stuff where Mm. we, are intentionally trying to like latch on to each other's like weird patterns and follow each other. Yeah. You'll hear that a little bit more. Well, we'll kind of like latch on to each other. Mm. Um, and just cause like it was fun to just sort of like try to read each other in the moment and mm. try to pick out where we think it might go next, you know? Yeah. And, and also when you do that, when you really try to like copy someone's rhythm or their pattern, it really puts you out on a limb. Mm. in a big way because if you're really locked in like you're probably gonna mess it up (laughs) you're probably not gonna come out of it at the same place or whatever you know like and and learning how to you know just sort of like being out there you know on the edge with someone is kind of exciting and it will like brings up like a lot of weird emotions and <laughs> and, uh, it's, it's fun. It wasn't always, it wasn't always good, but it was always fun and it was like always entertaining for people, you know, yeah. it, to watch just cause it was like, so something that could only happen right then, you wow. know, it was, it was so in the moment and that was it, you know, yeah. and Alan was, was sort of made that same way. You know, we went into the studio and we kind of, uh, 
the engineer jr kind of you know he set up mics and we did stuff but we pretty much just like rolled it and played mm. and i think like I think we kept just like everything. <laughs> like I think what's released, you know, wow. you know, wow. maybe we cut out some little bits like at the ends. I can't really remember how much we edited anything, but hmm. you know, wow. I think we were also pretty into, you know, like the, you know, uh, sort of like the weirder Miles Davis, uh, you know, like we could have approached those songs a little bit more like that where we start like layering tracks and then sort of like making the album mm. via mixing later. And we did a little bit of overdub things in there, but we didn't end up going with like the, the, the raw, clean kind of natural sound of it. It was the first time we'd ever really like sought to make an album that had that element in it. Mm. And we just sort of liked the way it came out. And, yeah, and there, there it stayed. <laughs> now, yeah. it's, now it's finally available. We finally released it after all these years. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, remind me of like uh, uh, John Cage. I don't know if you're familiar with 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 him as a piano uh-huh. player. Yeah, it kind of gave me like John Cage vibes. How you would just experiment with various various things around the piano. I mean, even even the performance where he just sat and looked at the piano and that was the composition, you know, or just like him like destroying like <laughs> the piano. Um, but just really like really interesting like sound pieces or like Cecil Taylor, like that those type of those type of vibes where it's it's, it's in a very Cecil not, Taylor is a, a hero of mine too. <laughs> yeah. 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 Just a very like a uh, non traditional way but that you know you definitely feel the the energy in it and it taking you you know somewhere so yeah that's definitely one i have to i have to to, to finish listening to but i came across that one i was like oh my goodness i'm gonna have to talk to him about this <laughs> um so not too yeah, i mean it's weird you know because like most people know me as oh sorry i think we have some lags <laughs> oh no worries no go ahead uh, i was gonna say you know like it's it's odd to i think you know, acknowledging the fact that I think a lot of people that like my music, like the guitar stuff and, um, you know, you know, <laughs> and then to like release a, you know, like a keys driven album and sort of a little bit left field, but you know, that comes, comes with the territory <laughs> of, of, <laughs> of what I do, you know, <laughs> it caught me off guard. I mean, I, I was, I mean, I, I didn't like stop listening or anything, but I was like, Oh wow. I was like, I, I should have known that, you know, that, that you know, like, I don't know why I would assume that you wouldn't play multiple instruments. And then also talking to you as well, as far as, you know, how, you know, I, think, I want to say it was your, your mother said that, that played piano. I was like, well, it completely made sense. Why? Like it would, you know, some way, say perform mm-hmm. you know, that you would, that you would play, be able to play the instrument as well so but no I, I listened to that and i was like oh wow interesting you know because and then i was looking at I was, I was like okay zach nelson playing piano <laughs> i was like trying to figure out who did what you know because i know uh-huh. you play many instruments so i thought that was an interesting uh discovery yeah. for me i was like oh man yeah, this is cool so <laughs> um i wanted to to play this one song here uh from uh, one of your other bands and if, if you could help me uh uh, with the pronunciation, I've been saying Hua to Hua, um, H A U T A H U A. Yeah, uh, we just say Hatahua. Oh, Hatahua. Oh, okay, you know. okay. okay. That, that, that's a lot. Of, yeah, yeah Hatahua. It's, it's it sounds it, yeah. it, it looks more complicated than it actually is. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to play this song here because I think this is. I know you did. A, you guys, you did a. Um, uh, you know, you sent a message to the the, the band camp as far as a, a link of you you guys playing in uh, Japan, um, but I wanted to play this song here because one of the ones that I was like, oh man, this is this is fantastic. Another another uh, another piece of music I have to own here from you. But uh, let me play this here. How how long uh, how long have you guys uh, worked on uh, this project for or been a been a band? Have you guys been a band for a while and had music that wasn't released for a while or? Um, well, so we, ha- we haven't played together in a little while. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, but I was just talking to these guys the other day we're, we're living on like opposite coasts at the moment, but, oh. um, uh, that, uh, that band, um, we, 
we were together for, you know, like kind of like going hard on it together for like kind of a short while. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe at the end, of um, maybe at the end of 14 and through 15, um, I think, um, a little over a year perhaps. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah. Or maybe about a year only. Um, we weren't together for that long. Um, and, but those guys are like, uh, still like really, uh, like dear friends of mine. And Mm -hmm. we've sort of been talking, uh, you know, no promises, but like, I would love to play music with those guys again. Mm. Uh, and we've been, we've been talking about it and I have, um, I have like more like snippet song ideas that, that I had written around that time, not like full fleshed out songs, um, uh, that I have sitting around to like start that project up again. Mm. But, uh, again, this is sort of like, you know, like the, um, you know, it's just sort of like something that happens to my projects. I might be kind of, I, I wonder sometimes no one's ever said this to me, but I might be kind of annoying to work with in that, <laughs> you know, like my projects kind of tend to come and go. Mm. Um, that one, we went really hard on it. We like did a little tour. We recorded that like little EP and then I don't really know what happened. Mm. Um, uh, you know, we, we, Gabe, the drummer, uh, is really, he's like an in-demand drummer. He's, cause he's quite good at a, at a wide variety of things and mm. plays with lots of different people. And so he was doing, did, did a couple of tours. And so we, th- there was always the idea. We knew that that band would have to like have these waiting periods. Um, and I think, yeah, I think with that band, I think it would have been, ideal had I done, you know, kind of what like Nick Reinhardt was like willing to do a little bit more, which was to like step into this like role of like pretty much fleshing out songs, Mm. um, you know, like on his own and then kind of like sending stuff out, everyone like learn the songs. And then when you get together, you maybe refine them a little bit. Mm. Um, had I done that process a little bit more, maybe the band would have like been able to keep, keep momentum but i kept i really wanted to a little bit different than nick and that i didn't really want to like do that process mm. so yeah i was gonna the, one of the last things I yeah to so ask, that's that's where that band is okay all right well yeah hopefully maybe in the future you know if the, if the world's uh if the planets align again you know definitely uh absolutely look forward to you know, or that, you know, if, if you guys work on something new in the future, definitely. Um, uh, one of the last things I wanted to ask you about was that for this piece of music, I wanted to play. It's one of your, one of the, one of the latest things, or at least as far as it being released anyway, one of the latest things that was released. Um, but let me play this for a second, just to ask you some questions about this one. Tell me a little bit of, as far as like the, uh, the inspiration around, uh, Gita, the traveler. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm one of like many musicians who over the pandemic got in you know, like, to sort of like making electronic music on my own. Um, mm-hmm. kind of, you know, maybe hunkered down and just worked on acoustic stuff. And I did do that as well. I just didn't record as much of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but, I, but I'm, you know, I'm a little bit of a, I'm a bit of a, a nerd, uh, you know, like when it comes to like, some some aspects of gear i like i do my own like amp work and i've i've uh worked as a repair tech and Mm. like get kind of like techie with like electronic stuff Mm. and uh so like i've always wanted a a modular synth and Mm. like i'd say right now like the like modular what's available in the modular synth and specifically in in euro rack and I'm sure in other, other like formats as well, but, but in your rack, there's a lot available and there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of like modules that do a lot of things in a small format. Mm. And it was just really interesting to me. I've always sort of like, you know, from 
you know, when I was younger listening to like Emerson, Lake and Palmer or, um, you know, Pink Floyd albums that I always loved. I always just, or, or Roxy music or Brian Eno. I always loved the synthesizer stuff and I always wanted to have access to like more options with that. So I, I finally like decided to, um, to, um, put together a system and, and started just messing around with sort of, uh, seeing what it was like to make a composition on a, on a modular synth, Mm. um, you know, where you're like composing by sending different amounts of voltages to like different parts of the synth instead of like composing in any like sort of normal way. So, um, that was sort of like one of my early experiments and I've, I've done more with it and I imagine I'll probably integrate it more and have it be less of like a, um, less of like the, you know, center stage, um, with stuff that I do later on, I'll probably, it'll probably be more of an element rather than uh, the main focus, mm. but, uh, but it's, it's totally fun. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Very cool. Yeah. I thought it was interesting. You know, um, I thought it was interesting I went, when I listened to it, I was like, Oh wow. I was like, he's getting into the, you know, the, the, uh, electronic side of, you know, Carson McWorth, but I, I'm wondering, have you always, have you always had that knack as far as like the, uh, when it comes to like, uh, experimenting in that notion or, um, like, have you always, or, or was that kind of a newer, newer thing that, um, you, you got interested in? Uh, you know, I've always, yeah, I mean, for a long time, I've, you know, before I've really even played a show, I have made music, uh, you know, on a computer or whatever, um, uh, like weird, you know, it's gone through different phases and it, I, I never really like understood or had any like knowledge of how, you know, someone like Aphex Twin went about stuff. And I was like only sort of like, like interested in a couple of different electronic artists and maybe for a a period of my life, I maybe even sort of might've even sort of scoffed at electronic music at Mm -hmm. different times. Uh, Or I, you know, I would say things like, Oh, I only like this and I don't like the whole the whole genre. I wasn't really into like dance music for a long time. I'm, I'm not as like hard line on any of that mm. now, but I, but I'm, I say that only just to say that I got, I'm not really like super in deep with electronic music. I don't know a lot of it. Um, mm. um, you know, so, uh, but yeah, I've all, I've always sort of been in experimenting and like, you know, you can kind of hear, that in like my earliest solo album stuff that's like available like on there there's like an an album um it's like none of this music is real i think or something like that Mm, (laughs) i can't remember what the title is now but uh that earliest album there's like a lot of uh and actually maybe every one of my albums has a little bit of like an experimental or ambient or like uh some some element to it that's like might be kind of electronic or whatever um so I, it's always been like sort of a, a side interest for sure mm. and i never i never got into really uh you know like uh i'm i'm friends with nick reinhardt and we've we've done improv shows together and like and stuff and i've and i and i so i see and i've watched him progress over the years or we've progressed you know, like mm-hmm. in parallel and kind of like parallel different directions, you know, <laughs> and like he got really good at, at working effects and it's, and it's absolutely amazing. He's like the Cecil Taylor of like, of effect footwork or something, yeah. you know, he's like, you know, seeing him like I- improvise with his pedals is like, it's like he has all the notes on the guitar, which is usually enough to like kind of confuse my brain. But mm-hmm. in addition to that, he has like all of the, footwork and like knows like a lot of the different sounds that are on his pedal board and stuff and that's totally amazing uh and i've no i never put in the time i wasn't in a in like a a physical enough like band like the early terramellos where you could like like really learn um uh music in a sort of like three-dimensional physical space Mm 
mm. that like was necessary to like take on um, that many different elements all at one time. And, and he just sort of, he's, he sort of excels at it. You know, he's like above and beyond what a lot of other people can, can like pay attention to at any given time. You know? <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I never, I never got good at the effects, but I love effects and I build them. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tinker with them and mod them and, you know, fix other people's effects. And and that was one thing in the advantage, uh, Ben Milner, who was one of the guitar players in the advantage, uh, he really sort of turned, uh, me on to a lot of like, um, the idea of like modding pedals and, and building pedals. And he would build all his own pedals like that he would use Mm. in that band. And, and I think he's built, a uh, number of pedals for Nick Reinhardt over the years as well. Wow. Um, yeah. Anyway, so we've always sort of like, I've always sort of been in and around the, the effect world, but never uh, made it as much of a focus uh, in my guitar playing. Hmm. Um, other than, you know, it's like you'll see in that like face tat video, I, I have a, a particular kind of like effect setup, but it's more just like I'm, you know, I'm just using it for tone shaping can I, uh, can as I, opposed to like what Nick does. So, yeah. Can I, yeah. can I ask you about that? Cause I feel, I, I'm so glad you mentioned that because, um, what, what is your pet? What, or I guess I'll ask you for, for, for face tat. What was your, uh, your pedal setup? Do you end up doing a lot of analog analog type pedals or just, more digitized like what what do you what what were you using for for face tap for that because that was one of the more and that was another like layer of interest for me too i was like what is he i was like what is he using like that was such a unique sound especially for that song yeah uh so that's a let's see if i can remember it Mm. i won't know this i won't remember this exactly but i didn't have a lot of pedals at that time Mm. i i had two that i built i had a a treble boost pedal mm. that I was using to, I, I had two amps mm. at the time. So I was running a stereo setup. I had a, a, a 50 watt trainer head, kind of like a basement or whatever, like the, it was called the bass master or whatever. I had one of those and I was slamming the front end of that with a, uh, with a treble boost pedal. So mm. it was like slamming it with treble but it was slamming it so hard that it was compressing it and bringing out the lows also. So, but, uh, wow. but, but still emphasizing the be, being able to like be clear. Mm-hmm. So I was running that and I can't remember, I know I had a rat, which mm-hmm. I've always had mm-hmm. and I still have the treble boost pedal and I still have the other pedal that I built was a, was a, uh, maestro brass master mm. i think which was a which was like the chris squire pedal it was like a fuzz pedal that had a had a clean channel and a fuzz mm. channel so you could like separate it um uh and i always like really loved uh chris squire's like bass tone which he run like two amps and he would like run that fuzz pedal so like some of the fuzz would go through one amp and it would be clean through another and that's uh-huh. basically what i was doing i was uh i was running two amps and i had the the trainer, which was just slammed, mm. uh, you know, the input was just all the way like maxed out. And then I was also running through a, which you can't see in a video. I was running through a, an SVT bass amp mm. that was in another room. And, and that was getting the, um, the sort of like, uh, like kind of octave fuzz mm. stuff. And I may have, I may have thrown a, like a low octave effect in there a little bit. And I can't remember if the rat was pretty much just distorting the SVT or if it was doing the whole deal. I kind of don't remember exactly how it was set up, but, Mm -hmm. but that was it. I think it was really maybe an octave pedal. Um, but I would usually sort of like dial it like way back because I didn't want it to be like super obvious. I just wanted it to like thicken up like a, like a distortion mound or something. Wow. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that, if that answers your, your question. <laughs> there was, you know, <laughs> yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Cause I was just thinking, I was like, wow, like what? Like, cause yeah, just, just as far as how, how that, how that, that signal, you know, came through and I was like, wow, that's so like 
interesting that sound you know so a depth that that's really neat yeah as far as just talking about how how you you approach that it, it is that is it, it sound it almost sounds like the component of how the or the strategy of how the music is coming out of the, your instrument is equally as important as the notes you play as far as you know you having it having that interest in the electronic side and also in the music side, it definitely seems like it coincides with one another, which I, I find really fascinating. Yeah. I would say like how I'm playing that song, mm. uh, maybe not so much like how it was like, well, maybe how it was written. Cause I was like kind of sculpting the tone. I hadn't, I hadn't worked that setup prior to, to working on that song. So as we were working on that song, I was, I was working that setup. I had actually come down there with a, thinking I was going to be playing a baritone guitar that I brought mm. and it just wasn't, uh, Zach plays so freaking loud <laughs> and, and full on all the time that I just couldn't, the baritone just wasn't cutting. So I just switched and I was playing everything just on the regular guitar. Mm. And then, so like that sound is sort of sculpted around me being able to work with Zach's tone. Um, and like, you know, so yeah, I guess the tone, mm is a part of the songwriting process in that regard. Awesome. Awesome. I don't, are, are we able to, are we able to play that? I don't know if, if, if does, does he own the right set? Or are we able to play a snippet of that? <laughs> I, I have some rights to some of that. Mm. Um, I think that, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really know exactly mm. <laughs> how all that works, but I, yeah. You know, yeah, it did get into this like, weird sort of gray area when, you know, you know, he's, he has like managers and, and, you know, licensing people that like deal with his stuff now. Oh, okay. And I don't have all that. Yeah. Um, and so unless he was to, you know, so now as far as like all those kind of people are concerned, like he owns the rights to all the YouTube video stuff mm. and, and you know, he owns the, the, the name of the song and the, mm. it's basically as far as like that, that like kind of legal world is concerned, like, uh, you know, it, it's his and I didn't, I don't have any part of it. You know? Oh, okay. Um, I won't play it then. And that's just sort of how that <laughs> stuff works. I mean, yeah. like he, he doesn't have a, spe- a, a particular stance on any of that, you know, as far right. as I know, as far as like we've talked about or whatever. Mm. And I've just, you know, never wanted to bring it up. But, so I don't really know. Yeah what who who gets what if it's played <laughs> i think it's fine to play it but i don't know <laughs> yeah yeah a part of me is like oh fair use i'll play more than this amount <laughs> this amount but uh yeah. I'll, I'll i'll just i'll just leave it be then but um i guess one of the last questions yeah uh, <laughs> one of the last questions uh you know any uh, i guess just you know you you've released a lot of music within this past couple of weeks which is definitely a joy um that i, I have to get i have to definitely get to uh what what's in store for the future for carson Mc- order yeah um so uh zach nelson and i uh, released that chantos project mm. um and i think we sort of decided we were gonna call our new project that we're we're finishing up now which is like you know a kind of like synth pop kind of a thing mm. or i don't know you'll have to see it's like it's weird it's weirdo catchy kind of bizarre and pretty mm. music or whatever mm. um and uh, uh we've been working on that for a, for a while and are excited to release that we were thinking about releasing it under the name wild guest mm. but i think we might just stick with chantos because that is sort of like what we have always called our collaborations in the past mm. and um so i'm finishing that up here soon hopefully this week um, i'll finish the last song and then um and then uh we'll do some sort of a release we really want to release it on vinyl so it might take a little bit longer to like actually put it put it all out there but Mm. um uh but there'll there'll be some updates and there'll maybe be a single so i have that coming up um Mm. and uh that's the most for sure album that I can mention, you know, the other things are like ideas of what I want to do. I've been, uh, I've been wanting to do an acoustic album for a long time. So mm-hmm. I've been working on that a little bit. Um, and then kind of non music related 
sort of uh, uh, through the pandemic, a thing that I started working on was like transcribing old songs of mine and sort of like relearning them all as a sort of way of jumpstarting sort of like the next phase of of writing guitar songs. Hmm. And so, so I just started learning a bunch of old stuff and, uh, and uh, transcribing it uh, kind of, uh, kind of jumpstarted because every, you know, um, I don't know know how (laughs) how much I, I should share of this. Well, Nick Reinhart teaches lessons and he got a hold of me because one of his students wanted to learn a bit of one of my songs yeah. and asked me if I had any tabs. So I was just like, Oh, well, I, I don't have any, any or the ones that I had made in the past were like kind of wrong, <laughs> <laughs> kind of like not done a super good job of some of the stuff that was out there. Yeah. Um, so I decided to like redo it and learn it and like make a tab. And I kind of gave it to Nick so that he can, he can teach his student. Um, cool. And that sort of just set off. I sort of liked doing it at the time. So I, so I had the idea of like, you know, putting together some sort of a tab book or something. I don't know what the best format I'm super like out of touch with how people do things these days. (laughs) Um, you know, I do kind of like the idea of a physical book, but that's maybe not totally like feasible that maybe some sort of, uh, maybe some sort of a digital release of, of tab Although I kind of don't like the idea of releasing it with one of the like the big tab companies because those websites kind of suck and yeah. um, they're they're sort of necessary and you know but uh, but I, I would I can imagine something a little bit better um, uh, so anyway so I've been working on that and uh, hopefully I will get that sort of wrapped up cool. in some capacity soon I got to figure out sort of like the the back end of that that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then everything else I already kind of like mentioned. Yeah. Um, that's yeah. So the the next Chantos album is like the next thing that's gonna come out soon. Um, nice. Yeah, we're we're excited to to put that out. It's it's a uh, it's different. Like you know, all my releases tend to be different. Um, uh, but uh, but uh, we've been putting a lot of effort into it. So nice. I, th- I think it's cool. Nice. One one I, one last question kind of came up to me as you were, you were mentioning talking about Nick Reinhardt. Any 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 f- future or world potentially where you and Nick Reinhardt would work together on a project? God, uh, we we have like like in the past like years back we like talked about it. Mm. We played we played together in my bedroom in Portland mm. and and recorded a little tidbit, but we never really worked. Um, you know, we never really worked aggressively towards anything. Um, I, so we're, we're not talking about it. That would be rad. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it's, but it's also sort of like, he's such a, he's such a force. He does, he can play like all the ideas that come into his head on guitar, but it's almost like, although I have a very different style than him, mm. it's like I- integrating them would be interesting. I, I think maybe, you know, something in the future like if he recorded the song and he wanted a you know something on it that was sort of like my style mm. and wanted me to lay a track over i'd totally do it um uh or you know vice versa if i like i was working on something and it's just like oh, i need like someone who's like got like a command of like all kinds of like crazy sounds and stuff i mean he's got such a unique sound that you can almost like you can almost pick him out even if you didn't know he was in a track, you would be like, Oh, that's gotta be Nick. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Like no one else that like does, does the, those sounds and, and in that way. So, um, I, I could definitely see wanting to use that at some point. Um, uh, or he's just like an awesome dude. And yeah. so I'm, I'm kind of just like satisfied with like, you know, kind of, kind of knowing him and like being stoked that he's making stuff. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, we haven't talked about a, a collaboration. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Well, uh, Carson McWhorter, this is a great honor. Uh, thank you so much for being on the show, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's been, uh, it's been cool to like kind of think through some of this stuff and, uh, kind of, I think it's going to 
help me be a little bit clearer about some of the things I'm working on in the future too. So. Very cool. Great. Very, very cool. Well, I'm going to close here with one of your songs. Uh, but yeah, again, thank you so much. And, uh, and, uh, all right, everybody. Well, that's going to wrap up here at the 440 guitar podcast, uh, here again. My name is Daryl Powell. We'll jam again soon. Uh, and have a good day. <laughs>